Anyways, what was I saying? There's this really obnoxious loud noise while I'm talking, but I just tested the video. I'm going to merge them together and you can hear my voice, I believe. Yes, indeed. Yes. You can hear my voice. There's no biggie. There's no biggie. So yeah, what am I going to talk about today? So, I got through a reading of a new book, Neil Strauss, The Truth. Now, I don't think I've covered this guy in my videos before, but um, Neil Strauss is a relatively well-known author. Uh, he was famous in the uh, early 2000s. He wrote this um, book, fuck, I forget what it's called. Uh, the, oh yeah, The Game. Uh, the Secret Society of Pickup Artists or something. And he's one of the founders, along with a few other guys of this whole Manosphere thing. So he basically wrote a book uh, detailing his story about how he learned pickup artist stuff. P-U-A acronym for short. You know, how to get laid and stuff. Um, and in this book he really glamorized the lifestyle. He wound up sleeping with, having sex with hundreds of different women and you know, he had a really, you know, in the end he accepted the whole beta male Disneyland monogamy paradigm at the end and had a sort of happily ever after fairy tale ending to the book. A complete Pollyanna waste of time. Anyways, he wrote a new book recently. It's been out for a while. Somebody just went by. I think you could see it in my glasses. But uh, yeah, he wrote a book called, Neil Strauss wrote a book called The Truth, where he sort of details that um, the pickup artist lifestyle that he's been living has given him all sorts of psychological problems. So he slept with hundreds of women, right? And for most guys, that's the dream, really. And so, he goes on about how, you know, he has major depression, uh, social anxiety disorder, general anxiety, all kinds of so psychological problems because he lacks a core sense of self, because everything he's fundamentally doing are scripted routines, you know, like magic tricks and all sorts of bullshit to get inside a girl's pants, basically. So he lacks a sense of identity. So the story is that he gets into this monogamous relationship with this woman named Ingrid. Now, he's basically a serial monogamist, which is our predominant culture, right? Serial monogamy. So going from one monogamous relationship to another. But fundamentally, they never work out because people ultimately get bored. We have a hardwired desire, both men and women, although with women it's a bit different. We have a desire for um, sexual variety. That's uh, Richard Dawkins, the selfish gene, right? Spread the seed, spread the DNA, all that sort of thing. But he tells the story, you know, how he gets in this relationship, but then he still, he checks himself into, you know, a sex addiction therapy. He goes to a bunch of orgies. He does all this weird stuff, fooling around, still doing the pickup stuff. He then has provided evidence in two books now that monogamy does not work. Monogamy does not work in the modern era with all of its technology and lack of social engineering. Now what I mean by social engineering is a third party intervention, say an institution like a church, Catholic church, whatever, compelling people to follow a narrative, to follow a script. Right, so the traditional script, say from the 1840s, was the guy goes and courts a woman on a bunch of dates, buys her dinner, eventually they form a relationship, and then he buys the diamond ring and they get married. He buys the ring as a symbol of his willingness to invest in her and invest in taking care of, of her and the children. And then they get married and they stay together for the rest of their lives or until they're dead, right? So 30, 40 year time horizon. Now in the 1840s, that was a pretty good deal because most people didn't really live past their 30s that often. You know, there were people that did make it into older age, but 
fundamentally it was an easier deal to sell. But now in the modern era, we have all this reproductive technology, um, more awareness of STDs, um, again, all sorts of temptation and options and possibilities out there that relationships really don't work out. I mean, when you can also think of it like fundamentally how interesting is anybody, right? Like I was watching David Chappelle and he's a funny comedian, right? But after you watch him for four hours, you're kind of going to figure him out. You know, like anybody, we're all sort of figure outable. You can figure, you can peg someone, hey, they're like this, they have these quirks and these characteristics, they like, uh, you know, they, they like their sandwiches a certain way, all that sort of thing. But yeah, they given all the options out there, it's not going to work out. But that's besides the point that I'm trying to make here. Ultimately, right, I'm an anti-natalist, so I'm against procreation. But you can look at early religious traditions once again, and I sort of went into this in my last video, but the early religious traditions, they didn't, they, because they couldn't knock procreation, they were aware, though, of life being fundamentally suffering and all this sort of thing. But um, yeah, they could never do away with procreation. But they understood that sex itself just causes all sorts of problems. Like, right, like, we all, and myself included, we're all a human, we all have a desire for sex. Once we're here, once we're in the game, once we're addicted. But sex just causes all sorts of, of problems, psychological problems, um, our instinct for variety, and then struggling with this Disneyland narrative that has never existed, right? So it causes problems. So I was reflecting on that, uh, story I told before about how uh, the anti-natalist woman that I knew from some Facebook groups, the couple, I'm not going to name their names, but they're into art, they're very distinct, you could figure out who I'm talking about if you're a part of these anti-natalism Facebook groups. Well, right, how she was having problems with her boyfriend who's an anti-natalist, and when she was going to start you know, a BDSM sex burlesque site with me, and I paid for the site. Anyways, she got mad at me. I made a comment that flipped her out, and uh, that, that project's over. However, she went back to her boyfriend, who's been addicted to amphetamine, and they've had problems before, and, you know, ultimately I give both of them a pass because we believe in the same thing. We're in fundamental agreement here, and I wish them well. That's not my point. But my point is you can see that all of this sex shit, that some of it's not coming from a good place, right? Like she was into this whole, or is into this whole BDSM thing and all that stuff. And that's coming from a place of um, childhood sexual trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, borderline personality disorder, um, you know, pedophilia, as a, experiencing that as a kid. None of it's coming from a, a good place. And she as well claims to be polyamorous, right? And it's a more modern thing that's becoming accepted, right? Where you have open relationships and all this sort of thing. Um, we haven't adapted yet to all of that, right? Like it happened before in the past. There has never been the happily ever after or the perfect monogamous couple. You see throughout history, right? That they, there, there was the beta arranged marriage kind of thing but that if a man got to a certain point and he was making enough money and he was providing for a family, he could go have a mistress and do all sorts of stuff. And, you know, I mean, people have been raping each other and doing this and that, sex stuff, right? All, all of history. But you can see that it, it's the source, it's the cause of all our fucking problems, for the most part. Without sex, we wouldn't be here. So paradoxically, I'm not anti-sex, but yes, I am anti-procreation. You know, sex can be, of all the experiences in life, you know, uplifting. It can be a great source of joy, but in the end, I think it breaks all of us. It really does ruin and destroy everything. And so you see in the early religious traditions, they combat sex, they demonize sex, uh, they make it something that, again, unless it's for the purpose of procreation, um, you know, don't do it. And I, and I mean, I can sort of understand that, that yeah, once you take procreation out of the equation, it's not a project, it's not a legacy that lives on. It's just hedonistic excess. And it doesn't go anywhere. 
like I said, outside of having children, sex does not go anywhere. None of our relationships with people go anywhere. It's as if, um, well, what Chuck Palahniuk said in one of his books, you know, that uh, to know that everyone in your life will either leave you, reject you, or die. Ultimately, it doesn't lead to any happiness. It all sort of ends in pain, depending on how serious you value the other person. Right? So you can have casual fling, you can sleep with a hundred people, you can have, a, like my grandparents, have a 50-year marriage. You know, in the end, it doesn't make any difference, right? Ultimately, it all ends in death. Yes, I know, another depressing fucking video. Yes, yes, yes. But I'm trying to make a point here about the whole sex thing. So again, I was thinking about that recent situation I was in with my now former friends and this guy's book. Our whole value system stinks. Ultimately, yeah, as long as people don't procreate, I got no problem with people fooling around and having sex and doing this and doing that. But at the end of the day, you can see that they, it's put on this pedestal, this pinnacle, this apex of fulfillment and, and happiness and joy and, you know, like I said, you take procreation out of it, you take away that whole life project script and social engineering and it all just falls apart in the end anyway. Again, that's sort of just my perspective. I mean, I could be wrong. Like I've said, of all my videos, I could be wrong, but yeah, life's fundamentally a raw deal here, a, a shitty deal. You know, I've sort of been depressed because I've grappled with, you know, my mom uh, ran a sex site. She was selling her used panties and doing all this stuff. She didn't have a very uh, positive outlook on men. Um, she wound up all alone, she died alone, as well as we all do. My father was married twice and had a couple of common law relationships with women. He is only 61, he's very bitter. He lives, I live with him, but he doesn't have any friends and he's not interested in another romantic relationship. It's sort of right, with, with people, you can have a, a, like a plate. Now it's sort of like that which doesn't kill you only makes you stronger, but except right, it's like smashing a plate. Now it's true, you can glue the plate back together, but every time you smash the plate, it gets a little harder to glue together. And ultimately, yeah, you can keep gluing it together, but at the end of the day, that plate will never be um, returned to its former glory. It'll never be a perfect, pristine plate like when it was first a plate, if you know what I mean. You know? And I, I think people, psychologically, we all have different sets of plates, right? So you can have your friendship plate and your romance plate and your career project plate and your hobby plate and stuff. For me, the whole friendship plate and romance plate have been broken. I'm not interested in doing them anymore that much. But for me, like my other plates, like my hobby plate is intact, my financial scheming plate's intact, my career plate is intact. So with all of that, uh, it gives me a sense of identity and purpose in life, and also trying to articulate a message of antinatalism and trying to get my message out there, which is difficult. But um, yeah, I guess that's my point, is that nothing that good comes of sex. So ultimately, as I've said before in other videos, I believe that in some bygone era, I would have been some kind of religious kook. I would have been some kind of a priest or a monk. I would have been celibate, and I would have been anti-sex. Because right, without sex you can't have procreation. But fortunately for us in our era, we have the choice, right? God may be dead, but we are now the gods, and we have reproductive technology and nuclear weapons. And we get to decide if the experiment continues. And I'd argue though that, again, the life project thing is fraught with peril and really not much good comes out of any of it. Not much long-term satisfaction or joy or happiness. Really. I mean, in the short term, yes, but in the long term, no. Well, I, I believe I've rambled enough here, but hopefully I make sense. I mean, I don't know, sometimes.
A little interesting update though on my personal life. I'm still working in my janitor job, but I've met a guy that sells life insurance and mutual funds. Now I have my own stocks and mutual funds and stuff. I've been working on a real estate business to get into income properties and private lending through RRSPs and stuff. I mean, I, I'm a nerd about all this finance stuff. I used to collect uh, gold and silver and other things. I don't think I've ever done a video on that. But anyway, this guy sells life insurance and mutual funds. So I'm gonna be taking some, some courses and some training to get a license to sell this stuff. So, my point being, there's been some conflict with the union that I'm in with the janitors. So it's at an industrial site, a steel plant, and it's, we're with a union that's a construction workers union, but we're janitors. Anyways, we haven't been getting our benefits. We have a benefits package, you know, like prescription drugs and uh, health insurance, right? The company and the union have been fucking around, and so we haven't been getting our benefits. We've been paying for it, but we haven't been getting it. So I've connected the dots here and decided with this insurance guy to try to sell a group benefits package to this section of the of the contract from my company and the union and it's interesting the ball is getting rolling and potentially a group benefit plan like initially with 30 people and perhaps it might balloon into like 400 people we're looking at I won't get the full commission I'll get like a finder's fee because I'm in training but potentially tens of thousands of dollars so you know that's pretty good and stuff like that I know that's all meaningless and pointless and and you know futile and whatever else and my pessimism is still intact but it's a buzz it's a high and uh yeah. I'll have lots of money and I can get laid and I don't have to care. <laughs> giggity, 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 goo. Nah, I'm only half joking there, but uh, yeah, that's my, that's my uh, stupid, shitty little life right now. So things are interesting. I don't believe everything happens for a reason. Things are pretty random, but uh, yeah, it's always the goddamn life trap. There's always something that happens that where you think shit's going somewhere and then your hopes get dashed and smashed to pieces and the plate falls and crumbles and gets smashed and then you glue the plate back together again and keep doing that until you die. <laughs> yep, that's pretty much it. Well, hopefully you can hear me with all this fucking goddamn noise. Anyway, Philosopher Stoner 666 out.